Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. The United States military is an institution that relies very heavily on training to protect the lives of its troops. After all, these men and women often operate in extreme conditions around extremely dangerous and advanced equipment. One particularly stressful test is designed to prepare troops in the event they end up in a helicopter that has crashed into the ocean. It's known as Helicopter Underwater Egress Training, or Hewitt. It's not only provided to helicopter crews, but to a wide range of troops, law enforcement personnel, and any other personnel who might encounter such a situation. There are multiple phases to this life-saving test. First, troops train with their temporary underwater breathing apparatuses while in full uniform. Relax, take a breather. They are also tasked with removing themselves from a mock helicopter fuselage within a certain amount of time. All of this training is done in an ultra-controlled environment inside a pool. However, the hope is that the troops will be able to react just as quickly should the real thing happen. While some may doubt the need for helicopter underwater egress training, it is important to understand just how much time these aircraft spend over the open ocean. Indeed, helicopters are integral to what's known as underway or vertical replenishment. This is when one cargo or troops from one ship are transported to another through repeated helicopter deliveries. This can be essential when traditional ship-to-ship -ship replenishment isn't possible due to sea conditions or other circumstances. As long as deck crews on both ships closely coordinate with the helicopter pilots, they can prepare bundles of cargo quickly enough to create a near constant chain of deliveries from one vessel to the other. Of course, helicopters also play an extensive role in at-sea training exercises, including a wide range of gunnery exercises. After all, helicopters are a more effective air-to-surface weapon than planes in some situations, as they can move at slower speeds, hover, and engage the target using a wider range of weapons. Troops are often tasked with manning the heavy machine guns present on many military helicopters. These drills and exercises help them become more familiar with the guns themselves, test their accuracy, and improve communication between the shooter and the pilot. Another vital role helicopters play in training relates to insertion. Known as helocasting, this is a process in which troops enter the water via a helicopter's rear cargo ramp. They first push the boat off, then jump into the water themselves.
Within minutes, they can have everyone in the boat and be underway towards their target. This sort of maneuver is ideal for operations or in situations where another type of insertion simply isn't realistic. It too requires a lot of coordination between the pilot and insertion crews, as the pilot must keep the helicopter at a safe altitude to prevent injury or damage to equipment. It might seem surprising, but the first combat helicopter wasn't introduced until midway through World War II. However, since then, they have become utterly essential to the movement of troops, weapons, and even vehicles to and from combat zones. This is due to the aforementioned sling-loading operations. Most helicopters are equipped with one or more cargo hooks attached to the bottom of their fuselage. This allows them to pick up heavy equipment and quickly move it from one place to another. However, it is not a simple process, which is why sling load training is a must for many military helicopter pilots. In the case of helicopters like this CH-47 Chinook, the cargo hook can be manipulated from the inside. This speeds up the process and keeps ground crews clear of danger. At other times, ground crews are required to secure the load to ventral cargo hooks. Again, pilots must coordinate with these men and women carefully to ensure all equipment and personnel are safely out of the way before attempting a lift. As usual, both sides of the equation will undergo rigorous training to ensure they're prepared to do the real thing. It says on the side, 10,000 pound capacity and 20... Lift and we lift. Everything went exactly according to plan. Um, the aviation unit came in and supported us, uh, getting the uh, equipment from point A to point B. Uh, the soldiers learned how to uh, maneuver uh, and how to uh, hook up any equipment that we had available uh, for any operation needed. The Chinook has been the U.S. Army's go-to heavy lifting copter since the early 1960s. It has a versatile, dual rotor design that can carry up to 22,000 pounds at once. This allows it to carry howitzer cannons, Humvees, and even small armored vehicles across the battlefields at speeds of up to 200 miles per hour. Its large fuselage is also designed to carry up to 55 troops, facilitating quick movements from place to place during virtually any conditions. Despite its aerial refueling capabilities, the Chinook does not have a longer transport range compared to cargo planes, which is why militaries typically prefer the latter for international transfers. Enter the Boeing C-17 Glowmaster. Since the mid-1990s, this massive cargo plane has been the workhorse of the United States military. Specifically designed to operate from forward operating bases of all kinds, this 174-foot aircraft can carry up to 170,000 pounds of cargo, vehicles, and personnel. That's nearly eight times what a single Chinook could deliver. It can also travel much faster and much higher, reaching speeds of 520 miles per hour and altitudes of up to 45,000 feet. 
For decades, the military has used a special airdrop process to deliver weapons and vehicles from extreme altitudes. In most cases, the cargo is packed onto pallets or into padded bundles. These are secured tightly with automatically deploying parachutes. Upon reaching their destination, the C-17's rear cargo bay will be opened, allowing the pallets to be rolled out. As they fall, the chutes will deploy, bringing the vehicles and other materials to a safe landing. They can then be retrieved by troops on the ground. Equipment is not alone in terms of the airdrop experience. Paratroops remain an essential part of how the military moves and deploys personnel. Then men and women are similarly tasked with jumping out of the plane over a specific area. To ensure no individual lands too far away from the rest of the force, they must exit the aircraft altogether in a very quick line. These troops hook their parachute cords to a line in the C-17 cargo bay to avoid accidents. This ensures the trooper's chute will deploy even if they lose consciousness or are injured during the fall. Of course, this process can be combined with airdrops to deploy an entire attack force in just a few minutes. With the C-17's speed and capabilities, the Army can move with unprecedented swiftness while still ensuring they have all the equipment, materials, and supplies they need to do their jobs. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.